طيب الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد We are done until verse number five. We're done. So we will move to verse number six. If you see any kind of pattern in the surah, please let me know. Share it with us. Okay, because you might detect something that <coughs> maybe I didn't notice or, someone, or others didn't notice. So that would be helpful. Uh, just going back to the bigger frame, the bigger picture of the surah. If you notice, and you will notice, that this could be the basis for social theory, social behavior in Islam. SubhanAllah regulates a lot of the social aspects, how basically the gen creating the general frame, then at the time of the Prophet وسلم, how to deal with him personally. Then we'll move on now to talk about how Muslims should deal with one another. How Muslims should behave in the society. It addresses a lot of the ailments, social ailments that have, uh, I would say, destroyed our Muslim societies and communities. These are important points that the Surah mentions so beautifully. And it, it's, I believe this is one of the miracles in terms of legislation. This Surah displays the miracle of legislation. How Beautifully, you could see a Muslim community or society would be if it really applies these things. Not only the specific instructions, but the all levels of these frames all together. This comprehensive system. That would be an ideal society. I said here it, it talks about how the companions should deal with the Prophet ﷺ. What about our times? The Prophet ﷺ is dead. We don't have the opportunity to interact with him. So how does it apply to our times? Is it relevant? It is definitely relevant. Definitely relevant. Because first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't place yourselves before Allah and His Messenger. That means when you learn something from Allah or from the Prophet ﷺ, an authentic sunnah, you should not place your preferences ahead of it. Example, which I mentioned before, you might say, this is my madhab. This hajj this year, some brothers raised the, an issue because about the timing of throwing the stones. In the three days of tashriq, you are supposed to do the throwing of the stones, rajm, after dhuhr. That's the t where the timing starts. But some people had a fatwa from some muftis that you can do it actually before Fajr. Well, actually you should wait until Dhuhr, but they took that fatwa. And they tried to apply it. The problem is with some of the agencies, the travel agencies, they do that just to save themselves some money. Nowadays, maybe in the past it was a necessity because some people died, were crushed in the crowds. But after all the recent changes in, in terms of Al-Jamarat, it became very easy. Even if it's crowded, still you can do it without any danger. But it works out much cheaper for the travel agencies to take people at night and you know, get them to do th two things in one journey instead of doing each one separately. So the question was raised by some people. I said, well, we asked, we, there's a free phone that you could call, the ifta of Saudi Arabia. They speak to a sheikh and ask him a fatwa. So they asked, they said, well, we got a fatwa that we can do the jamarat or throw the jamarat before Fajr, after midnight. Is that okay? He said, no. And if you've done that, you have to repeat them again because it has to be after dhuhr. Till after the whole on, you can still do it. If you are late, you can do it the day after. But you cannot do it before, the night before. So they went back to the imam or the, the, uh, the guide of that group. And he said, 
obviously there was an argument, but ultimately he said, why don't you call the guys back in Jordan? They were, they were from Jordan. So they called one of the muftis, official muftis there in Jordan, and they said, okay, that's the case. He said, don't listen to these Saudi guys because they are Hanbali and we are this and this madhab. We follow our madhab, they follow their madhab. I said, subhanallah. Does this bring unity to the Muslims or does it bring hatred and dissension? They are Hanbali, we are Shafi'i or Hanafi. What kind of answer is this? Don't we follow the same prophets? <laughs> Don't we worship the same God? What, is, what answer is this? The answer should be, which opinion has more evidence? That's it. All the great Imams have all respect and we learn from their heritage, but it doesn't mean we put them in the place of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the kind of argument that you get in different places, in different scenarios, and on different occasions. These are people who are basically placing their madhab, or placing their culture, or placing their preference in the case of the travel agency, ahead of Allah and His Messenger. So that's one uh, implication that relates to our time. Another implication is that we should see how much respect the Prophet ﷺ deserves, even if it be in the way we speak to him. Some of the scholars took from this verse that when you go and visit the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and you give him salam, you should never raise your voice. Speak quietly with calm. Speak quietly and never raise your voice and never have an argument. Some scholars said in Medina specifically, you should never ever have an argument. Never raise your voice. Because the Medina, the city of the Prophet ﷺ, observed this etiquette. Another thing relevant, which is when these people came and called the Prophet ﷺ, when he was in his house, that's an etiquette that we could observe not only with the Prophet ﷺ, even with others. That you sh we should observe the times, the, the routine of some people. If that's the time for the rest, you don't go and knock on their door. Observe that. <coughs> Respect it. When, you, when you're knocking at the door of someone, you don't scream, shouting loud the name. Don't do that. If you were to tell someone, like here in the masjid, who's on the other side, you don't scream at him, don't shout. It's better, it's closer to the Islamic etiquette to walk to that person and tell him politely what you want. Imagine if we Muslims observe this, brother, brothers with brothers, sisters with sisters. This mutual respect and it appeals to the fitrah, it appeals to human nature. <clears throat> now we'll move to verse number 6, which is very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَئٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا أَنْ تُصِيبُوا قَوْمًا بِجَهَالًا فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ very important etiquette. Or you who believe, again, Allah reminds them, connects them to the general frame. If you believe, then this falls within the frame of this belief. So it should be natural to you, should make sense to you. If a disobedient person or unreliable person comes to you with a piece of news, don't act on impulse. Verify it. Verify it. Make sure that this news is true and accurate. True and accurate. That's fatabayyanu. That's the meaning of the word fatabayyanu. Verified. It means make sure it's true in the first place. Higher level fine tuning is about making sure it's accurate. Lest you act based on it and you wrong someone and ultimately you will end up being regretful. You regret what you did. So that means don't act on impulse. When someone comes to you with news, it depends. The scholars say if he's known for his truthfulness and his sound judgment, truthfulness and sound judgment, you take his word for it. But before you act, still find out more. And I'll 
mention the reason. If this guy is unreliable, don't give it much credit, but find out what's the truth. Because it's still, it's a piece of news that went into your ear, it must have touched your heart, so find out the truth. Because sometimes you might hear something about your brother and say, well that's not true, and you ignore it. But it starts acting in your heart, creating doubts. So next time you hear something negative about this brother, you say, oh, there's something there. You start to believe it. So it's good to verify it, even if you don't seem to believe it. What you hear, by the way, is part of this closed system. What you hear goes into your heart. You might say, a lot of people say, you know, I'll go to listen to this group, that group, this person, that person, I don't mind. Whatever truth they say, I will take it. What's wrong, I will leave it. And who told you you can do that? The teacher of Imam Malik. His teacher is, is called Maymun ibn Mahran. Maymun ibn Mahran. A wonderful scholar. He has a beautiful statement where he says, ثَلَاثٌ لَا تَبْلُوَنَّ نَفْسَكَ بِهِنْ Three things never get yourself involved into. Never. Three things never put you, three situations never put yourself in. First one, he says, أَن تُصْغِيَ بِسَمْعِكَ إِلَى صَاحِبِ هَوَى فَإِنَّكَ لَا تَدْرِي مَا يَعْلَقُ قَلْبُكَ بِهِ First thing, that you listen to a person who has a bid'ah, innovation, desire. Okay? His approach to the deen, his understanding of the deen is messed up. That you listen to him. Because you don't know what's going to stick to your heart from his speech. So never, never jeopardize your heart. Never. Say, I'll listen, then I will judge and I will choose. That's not how human nature works. And that's why it's not, it's not right. A lot of the Muslims who love this ummah, who are keen for this ummah, they spend most of the time listening to the news. You will swallow it. A lot of people watch movies, I know that. A lot of people you know, watch TV and say, we just, you know, we watch that to be, you know, you know keep connected know what's going on around. But everything that goes in through these two things yeah, in your head goes into your heart. And it builds up and it, then it assumes or it builds momentum and it could change who you are. And that's the meaning of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says about taqwa and iman أن تحفظ الرأس وما وعى that you preserve your head and everything that goes into it go through your ears through your eyes even smell sometimes and what you say as well because what you say you said returns back that's taqwa preserve that so don't listen to anyone and that's what I said when you listen to whatever news comes you might not believe it but it creates, it carves a place in your heart about this person or that person. Another, and that's what the media does. It throws a doubt here, a doubt there. They, throw, th they throw, uh, throw an accusation here, an accusation there, and it turns out to be false and wrong. And they, they don't have a problem saying, okay, that turned out to be wrong, fine. But they've got their point across. They know, they have a different study. They're building up, they're piling up you know, something in your heart which ultimately is going to create some change in you. Even if you, even in the masses, they will say Muslims did this and that, they did this and that, then they'll say, oh, sorry, it turned out investigations showed that this is not true, it's a different story. Okay, fine, but they got their point there. Done. And they do it again and again and again, and no matter how much they apologize and say, I was wrong, the, the, the first impact is the biggest impact. And that's the game they play. So be careful. When you get news, verify it. Verify it even if you don't seem to believe it. 
I'll finish Ibn Mah Ibn Maimun Ibn Mahran's statement just for the sake of benefit. So the first thing, don't listen to a man of desire, a man of innovation and bid'ah because you don't know what's going to stick to your heart. Second thing, which answers a question that sometimes you have good intention but you can't do the wrong thing. You have to do it right. He said, أَن تَخْلُوَ بِمْرَأَةٍ تَقُولُ أُعَلِّمُهَا الْقُرْآنِ that you sit with a woman alone and you say, I'll teach her Quran. Uh, don't play that game. <laughs> don't play that game. I'll sit with her, and I'll you know, intention is good, I'll teach her Quran. Don't get yourself into that. And third one, that you sit to the people of power and governance and that impacts your heart. Or you try, you sacrifice your deen for the sake of pleasing them or appeasing them. And tadkhula ala sahibi sultan. Okay. <clears throat> so whatever news comes to you, verify it. Because if you, if you don't do that, you will end up wronging someone. And when, thing, when things clear up, you will regret your course of action. That's number six. We'll move on to number seven. Now, it was specific. How to deal with news that comes to you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here takes it to a bigger frame. A wider frame. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِدْتُمْ And know that among you is the messenger of Allah. That's a gift from Allah. It's a great gift. Don't underestimate it. Take it back to our first principle. Be thankful. Be thankful. Appreciate that gift that the Prophet ﷺ is amongst you. So make sure you make full use of this. If he were to follow your preferences, in many issues, or most issues, you would end up in hardship. That's something about the maqasid of sharia. Ah. You want ease for yourself. You want success. You want tranquility. You want happiness. You will never find it but in the sharia ah of Allah. You will never find it. Because we humans can't see round corners. Our perception, our understanding is limited. And the reason, the most important reason Allah sent down His Sharia ah of Islam, the instructions, the injunctions, lawful and unlawful, even the punishments, the reason Allah sent them down is to bring about ease to humanity. That's the biggest reason. The scholars of Islam said this statement repeatedly. You can find it as early as the 4th century after Hijrah. You can find it in the statements of Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam. You can find it in the books of Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. You can find it in the books of Al-Qarafi. You can find it with Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim, and later scholars. They say that Sharia was sent down لِجَلْبِ الْمَصَالِحِ وَدَرْءِ الْمَفَاسِدِ Sharia was sent down to bring about benefit for you in this world and repel harm and hardship. Ibn, Ibn al-Qayyim take, takes it a step further in explanation as he was explaining Surah Al-Infitar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Infitar إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ Indeed, the righteous ones are in ecstasy and tranquility and Al-Fujjar, the wrongdoers, the people who do evil, disbelievers they are in jahim, in pain and punishment and chastisement. Ibn al-Qayyim says anyone who thinks that the righteous are in tranquility in paradise only and the evildoers are in chastisement in the hellfire only then he's wrong the people of Iman are in peace and tranquility in this world in the grave and in the hereafter and the people of disbelief are in pain and chastisement and agony in this world in the grave and in the hereafter. 
So if, human, if humanity wants prosperity, tranquility, peace, justice, ease, there's nothing but Islam to get them there. Because we can't see round corners. Allah is saying if the Prophet were to follow your preferences, your advice, your perceptions, you would end up in hardship. La'anittum. And it's the extreme, most extreme level of hardship. La'anat. Extreme level of hardship. SubhanAllah. So Sharia was not only sent for paradise, or for, just to get you to paradise, that's one of its objectives. But among, amongst the most important objectives is to make life livable here. To make sense of everything. To make everything meaningful and to get you at the highest level of life. The best life humans can achieve is through the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِصْيَانِ But Allah made iman and the meanings of iman lovable to you. They made them appealing to you. حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Allah beautified iman to your hearts. And Allah brought hatred in your hearts towards disbelief, towards sin, towards disobedience. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about here? Fitra. Every human being has this. Every human being originally have love for Iman, Tawheed, love for obedience, righteousness, and hatred and disgust towards disbelief and sin. Everyone. And this is why I said people have to get out of their way to love sin and embrace it. They have to get out of their way. They have to do something against their own nature to get... It's a struggle. It's a struggle there. I remember reading a story of someone who was uh, addicted to alcohol, an alcoholic. And he mentioned the first times he drank alcohol, he felt so bad about himself. He felt nasty. He felt filthy, etc. And he said, when I felt that, I was crying and feeling bad about myself. And it was the company around him that told him, you know, when you have this feeling, drink more. Drink more. He said, I drank more and drank more until that part of me died. You have to go against your nature to get into sin and to get into all that type of disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about fitrah, but there is a special level, okay? There's a special level where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifies iman in someone's heart and he makes them follow it. And that's the believers, the ones who act in accordance with this fitrah. That's a special gift from Allah. Why does he give it to them? Why does he give it to them? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause some people to act accord in accordance with this nature and He leads some people to go against it? So these people follow Iman and the truth and avoid sin and hate it. And the other ones, they have the opposite, have hatred to Iman and they develop love for sin and disbelief. Why? Who can tell me? The answer was in this lecture. Surah Ibrahim وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٌ And Allah has made it clear. It's an announcement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you act thankfully, if you are thankful, Allah shall increase you in goodness. But if you are, act ungratefully, the punishment of Allah is severe. And we said it might be a subtle form of severeness. So that answers the question, why does Allah guide some people and He misguides others based on this principle? Allah is just. Allah is just. وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْا زَادَهُمْ هُدَىٰ And those who have followed guidance, they strove to follow guidance, Allah increased them in guidance. 
Allah says in another surah, فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ When they chose misguidance and they went in that way, Allah caused their hearts to be more misguided. Justice, jaza and wifaq. Allah is just. So no one goes into disbelief after, I have to make something clear, people have to hear about the true message of Islam. Make that clear. Make that clear. Before we take that stance and that, make such a judgment about people, they have to go the, this, through the stage of knowing, encountering the true message of Islam. Otherwise, we'll start you know, throwing judgments on people, just like that. So it's a higher level of love for Iman and hatred to sin that Allah has given these people. What does Allah call it? أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ These are الرَّاشِدُونَ the same description of the four rightly guided caliphs. Rashidun, right, right, rightly guided. What does that mean? That means they have the right iman in their hearts and they do the right actions. That's rushd. It's called rushd. The adjective is rashid. Rashid. The plural is rashidun. These are the rashidun. So how do we get it? By seeking guidance and Go to the first verse. Go to the first verse. What does it say? Do not place yourself or your opinion before Allah and His Messenger. You need to do that. Imam Madik, someone, the famous story, someone came to me and he said, I want to start my ihram from the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, close to his grave. But we know you have to go to what is known today as Abiyar Ali, where you do your ihram from Medina. Imam Malik looks at him. Imam Malik, by the way, he loves or he likes general frames. You can find this a common theme in his fiqh. He said to him, I'm afraid you will fall into fitna. The guy says, what? I mean, what fitna? I'm asking you about going and making a haram from the masjid. It's just a couple of miles that I'm, added, I'm adding. He said to him, I'm afraid you will fall into a fitna, a trial. Imam Malik, if Imam Malik were specific, he would say, no, that's wrong. But he took him to a, a bigger picture. I'm afraid you will fall into fitna. He said, what fitna? It's a couple of miles I'm adding. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةً this is at the end of Surah An-Nur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Let those people who do not follow the command of the Prophet وسلم, let them be afraid or let them beware, lest a fitna befalls them or a severe punishment. So just because of contradicting the Prophet وسلم, with one instruction, he said you might fall into, into fitna. What is this fitna? That's what I called a pattern. You might fall into a sin and it takes you into a pattern. You get carried away and you develop that pattern of sin. So you start with a small sin, but you end up doing a huge one. So don't underestimate the power of a sin. It could overtake you and, estab and it could establish a pattern and it's hard to break from patterns. So whatever the Prophet ﷺ gives you, follow it. By, by means of this, you go to a higher level, more love for Iman, more hatred to disbelief, and then you get a higher level of Rushd, you become Rashid. You have this Rushd, so you have more Iman and you are, more a, you are able to do more deeds. You're able to do more deeds. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fadlam min Allahi wa ni'ma. That's number eight. Fadlam min Allahi wa ni'ma. Wallahu alimun hakim. This high level of Iman is a gift from Allah. It's a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has graced you with it. Why? Because of there, there are actions, but it's completely from Allah. So don't, it's not because of your own merit, it's not because of your own excellence, but it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in matters of Iman, don't be proud about yourself. Don't say, oh, I've done that. You know, I've worked hard and I'm reaping the fruits now. No. Don't attribute that to yourself. Just be polite with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, it is Allah who guided me. It is Allah who increased my iman. It is Allah who made it easy for me to do these righteous deeds. And all praise belongs to Allah.
Because that's the reality. That's the reality. It's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all a gift from Allah. If Allah were to leave you alone, Allah said, if He were to leave you alone, you would perish. All of you would go to the hellfire. It's Allah's help that is guiding you this way. Uh, verse number 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here talks about if two groups among the believers fight. Fight. Now here it doesn't mean fist fighting. That means proper fight where Muslims kill one another. Qital is about killing one another. What is, for those who study Arabic, what is a fist fight? What, how, do you, how do you say that in Arabic? It doesn't have to be literal translation, but there's a word for it in Arabic. Darb is beating. You could beat someone, but it's not a fight. Mushajara. <laughs> Mushajara. Okay? It's called Mushajara. Or Shijar. Same root. Shijar or Mushajara. That's a fist fight. But Qital is proper warfare. We're talking about warfare. So, could Muslims fight among themselves? Well, welcome to the real world. Yes. They shouldn't, but they're human beings. So they could get into a fight. Either because of their own weaknesses or because of another factor, a third party, like what happened among the companions of the Prophet Ideally, Muslims should not fight because people get along because of what they believe in. If I have the same convictions as you, the same roots, then we usually get along. That's why people you know, get along or they don't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you see, Allah is addressing all possible scenarios. Muslims should not fight. Believers should not fight among each other. But it could happen. What if, what if it happens? You need to have an answer. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is specific. And if two groups among the believers fight, then bring about reconciliation. Bring about reconciliation. This should be your goal, reconciliation. But it's not any kind of reconciliation. It's not any type of reconciliation. There's a principle there. Then Allah says, فَإِنْ بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِي If it happens, because most of the fights happen because of misunderstanding. But in case one of them has the truth and the other one is aggressive, is transgressing the limits, and is offending the other, and it's an apparent case, what should you do here? Someone, one group from among the Muslims has wronged the other and they, are, they have initiated an attack, an aggression against them. And the other ones are defending and they are the ones on the truth. What should you do there? Stand with the ones who have been oppressed. Why? Because reconciliation can only be achieved when two parties want to reach that point. But if one of them is initiating an aggression, it doesn't want to. So what do you do here? You don't stand neutral. You need to support the oppressed. You have to. It's an obligation to support the oppressed. Now there's a debate among the scholars. Do you do that individually? Or does it apply to a state or people who have the power? The most correct opinion is that it's people who have the power. People, because as an individual, mainly you don't have the means to assess the situation. You don't know who, who's on the truth. Another thing is that you're just an individual. So that's basically addressing the general body of the Muslims under their leadership. Okay, so if one of them initiates an aggression against the other one, then fight against it. فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيءَ إِلَىٰ أَمْرِ Until it comes back 
to the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They come back to justice. So you have to stop them against their aggression. Prevent them from proceeding with their aggression. You have to stop them. Now, at the time of the companions, when there was a dispute between Ali radiallahu anhu on one side and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu on the other side, mainly the aggression was a misunderstanding. It's a matter of, of ijtihad. Each one of them had an ijtihad because the ijtihad of Ali ibn Abi Talib was I've been chosen to be the Khalifa and I don't see point in punishing the people who killed Uthman at the time because they have a lot of supporters and they could make things worse. Slowly I would push them out of their connections and when I establish my power I'll bring them to, the, to justice. That was his point, it was wise. In Asham, where Muawiyah was, his point was, these people are murderers and they killed the Khalifa, Uthman. They have to be punished first, establish justice, and then we give our bay'ah to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Simple. He had a strong point still there. It's ishtihad, difference of ishtihad. Yet who was in the middle? The Khawarij and Abdullah ibn Saba', the one who initiated the Shia sect. These guys, they are the, they are the ones who brought the war about. It, wa it was almost impossible for these two armies to f face each other. It was, and they actually reached a point of agreement, but it was Abdullah ibn Saba' and his people who sneaked into the army of Muawiyah when they was, when they was asleep at night and they started slaughtering people and they sent another group to Ali ibn Abi Talib's camp and they started slaughtering some people. So each one said, these people have uh, you know, set us up and this was how the, the fight initiated. But it was almost impossible to take place. So Muslims could fight among each other. What should be done is that you bring them back to the truth and reconciliation, but it has to be based on the truth. If someone is on the wrong, they have to pay the price for it. It's not only reconciliation. And here where the verse takes us, فَإِنْ فَاءَتْ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَخْصَطُ If the aggressors, if they come back to the truth, then bring about reconciliation based on justice. Any reconciliation without justice is vulnerable and is not accepted in Islam. Reconciliation has to be based on justice. You know, there's a school in, uh, of leadership or theory and leadership called manipulative leadership. There are people who are very good uh, at communication. And they could make things look very rosy for you. And they get you to give up your right in a dispute. They have sweet speech, sweet words. They get you to give up your right in a case to reach a point of, re of conciliation. Once you reach that point and things get back to normal, you realize you've been set up. There's something wrong there. What happens, a lot of people go back and create a bigger problem. So this is why reconciliation has to be based on justice. Everyone has to take their right. If it's not based on justice, it's not a real uh, reconciliation. It's a joke. It has to be based on justice, you see? And subhanAllah, justice is, is always mentioned a lot of times in the Qur'an indirectly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu alladhi nazzala al-kitaba bil-haqqi wal-mizan Allah sent down the book, the Qur'an, with the truth and the scale. What does that mean, scale? The concept of justice. The concept of justice. And this is why Imam Ibn Taymiyyah says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives power and dominance and sustainability, continuity, to a state, even if it's based on, on disbelief. A state, if it's based on disbelief, Yet, it establishes justice. Allah gives it, gives it durability. 
and power. And Allah causes a state, a, believe, a state of believers, to fall down if it's not based on justice. They have the true religion, but they don't establish justice. Allah caused them to fall. And a state based on disbelief, established on disbelief, but they bring about justice. They operate among people. Based on justice, Allah gives them power and dominance. This is why justice is very important. If you were, I mean, this rule applies to even personal disputes. Don't bring about reconciliation if you're going to waste someone's right. That's not reconciliation. That's, that doesn't please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is justice. Now, if someone, one of the parties, decides to give up his own rights and seek reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he acknowledges that, that that's my right, and I give it up for the sake of Allah, that's fine. It's fine. The scholars usually say towards the end of time, towards the end of time, because fitna will increase. People would not know what is, you know, truth from falsehood. People will start killing one another, not knowing even why. Like what's happening in Syria now, even Lebanon and other countries. The scholars say, nasa bil fadl, la bil adl. What does that mean? Treat people based on the principle of fadl, giving up your own right. Wa alaykum salam. Giving up your own right. Not based on getting justice for yourself. That's a personal choice. Okay? Someone wronged you, wronged you forgive them. Don't seek your right. Sometimes a case is very complicated and you find Someone insists, I want to get my own right. I want to get my two pennies. I want to get them. It's justice. It's, isn't, it's my right. Yes, it's your right. But you could solve a huge problem just by giving, the, giving that up. But he insists, no, I want justice, even if it's one penny. I want it. Isn't, it's, it's my right. You can't argue with him. But he's bringing about trouble for himself and for the others. So this is why the, professor, uh, also not, the scholars say, Towards the end of time, you treat people with, not with justice, based on your, you know, by giving up some of your right as well. Why? To preserve your religion. Because if getting into disputes at that time could waste your time and get you into so many situations where your, your religion will be at jeopardy. That's towards the end of time. This is why sometimes getting into disputes especially about matters of religion, is not a good thing. Sometimes people might wrong you, say something bad about you. Don't say, that's my right, and they will have to admit it. Leave them. Leave them. Save yourself, because argument will kill your heart. And the Prophet ﷺ said, أَنَا زَعِيمٌ بِبَيْتٍ زَعِيمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ فِي وَسَطِ الْجَنَّةِ لِمَنْ تَرَكَ الْمِرَاءَ وَإِنْ كَانَ مُحِقَّةِ I am the master of a house, a place in paradise that is made specifically for people who give up arguments even if they are on the truth. Because argumentation kills your heart. So you always see your, your target should be at preserving my religion. If getting involved, yes, I might have lost some of my rights here, yeah, but if getting this right means I'm going to jeopardize my religion, it's not worth it. Give it up for the sake of Allah. That's a personal choice. But generally speaking, if you are to bring about reconciliation among people, make sure it's justice. It's not just pleasing people. Don't play mental games. No, it has to be justice. That's the only way you can guarantee this reconciliation is durable. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah yuhibbul muqsitin. At the end of the verse number nine. Indeed, Allah loves those who bring about justice. That shows you that Allah loves justice. Allah loves justice. And then that, that can tell you so much about Allah. It can tell you so much about Allah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying Allah loves just Allah loves people who bring about justice. That's what the verse says. 
Allah brings the people who bring about justice. Now you know you will wait to the love of Allah. You say, how can I, how can I get Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love me? Establish justice with everything you do. Even if you have the power to do something wrong, don't do it. Bring about justice. If you go into the supermarket, okay, and the cashier makes a mistake and you get more money than you deserve, more change than you deserve, even if it's little change, go and give it back. You've wronged someone 20 years ago. You've wronged them. And it was never settled. You might feel, oh, it's, it's history now. No, no, bring about justice. If you start to seek justice, the love of Allah will start to come to you. You will earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, that's a way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-adl. He is the one who is just, who brings about justice. Now you see this name in reality. You see, Allah loves those who bring about justice. So you know now some of the implications of this name, even with your kids. When sometimes it happens a lot with parents, two kids fight, the parent does, doesn't want headache, okay? One of the kids wrongs the other. He just wants them to be quiet. He doesn't care about you know, who, wronged, who wronged who. And sorting out the whole problem. Just stay quiet, okay? Or he grabs this toy from this boy and he gives it to the girl and so on and so forth. Just keep quiet and that's it. He thinks he, you know, he's sorted it out, but he has not. It will bring about hatred among the, bro the, bro the brothers and the sisters. Sort it out, even if it's to this level. You know, it's, it was narrated about, mentioned about Al-Bukhari that he was one day trying to, Al-Bukhari and others, that they, uh, he went to that person because he heard that he, he narrated some hadith. He wanted to go and learn from him. So he saw him outside and the guy was trying to get his mule. There was a mule. He, was, uh, he, he wanted to get it close. So he just pretended as if he had something in his hand to feed it. So the mule came close. He was observing, the Bukhari was observing and he saw there was nothing in his hand. He turned back. If he lies to an animal, I don't I have no guarantee that he won't lie against the Prophet It's a pattern, you see? It's a pattern. So you might say it's a small thing. Small th it's a small thing, but that's what gets you the highest ranks in paradise. Small things. These small things. Because it's about establishing the patterns. Anyway, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after talking specifically now, Allah moves on to the bigger frame. Linking things together. You see, different levels of understanding. Different levels of, of framing things, framing reality. Allah relates them to to one another. So Allah here says, number 10, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةَ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ Now, all of these instructions stem from the general rule, believers are brothers to one another. That's it. Now, if you grasp this rule, you could easily figure out the details. But still, Allah appears to different learning orientations. People have different learning styles. So Allah appeals to all. And it could be a better way of moving on from details then to then establishing the general rule. Indeed, the believers are brothers to one another. That's a universal thing. Believers are brothers. You know, what brings brothers together? Blood brothers. Commonalities. Things they have in common. Things they have in common. Iman creates more commonalities among people than blood brotherhood. See how powerful Iman is? Iman shapes who you are, or at least it should. <laughs> this should be the case. It shapes who we are. So when you have true Iman and someone else has true Iman, you have more in common with them than with your blood brother. That shows you how deep the issues of Iman are, the realities of Iman are. They dig deep into the inner recesses of human nature the deepest elements of human nature, that's where Iman is. That's where it acts, and that's where it produces its results. So that's the general rule. And fear Allah, again, 
the concept of taqwa, awareness of Allah, consciousness of Allah, fear of Allah's punishment, that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be your motivation. It should always move you to action. Notice Allah he says, so you may be or you may receive Allah's mercy. Look at this. You may receive Allah's mercy. So all these things, all these things bring Allah's mercy. Now, uh, just going back to the question the brother asked me yesterday. I haven't finished my point. He said, what can we do to the Muslims in Gaza? What can we do to them or for them? I said, the problem is much deeper than what's happening now. It's been building up. And that's only one of the manifestations of this problem. Now, if you don't deal with the problem at a root level, we'll be wasting our resources. We'll be wasting our resources. You can do things on a personal level, give sadaqah, make dua sincerely, which is not little, but in order to sort out the problem, you need to go deeper. Go deeper. How can we go deeper? What does it mean when the Muslims are being you know, subjected to these trials? Muslims are being killed, slaughtered on a daily basis in Syria, in Palestine, and it's been happening in Kashmir for a long time, Afghanistan, uh, Chechnya, you name it, Somalia, all these trials. Some are, some are killed, some are suffering financially, some are suffering socially, some are suffering mentally, some are suffering politically. In Egypt, it's not a joke. What's happening in, in Egypt is not, is, is not something in, like simple. There's something serious taking place in Egypt. All these sufferings, what are they a sign of? That we, we're not getting enough of Allah's mercy. Now here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concluding it with mercy. So if we don't have enough brotherhood, if we don't truly treat one another as brothers, then we are depriving ourselves of Allah's mercy. And as a result, some of us are being slaughtered and killed. Some of us are being financially <coughs> deprived. Some of us are, uh, are, face, are, are politically suffering. It's, some of us are going astray. That's a form of suffering. It's even worse. So you might say, no, it's all political. It's, it all has to do with the Assad regime. It has to do, you know, political situation. It has, and you are just talking about the surface. Deep, deep, deep down. What is the reason? We are not brothers to one another. Look at the Muslims everywhere in the world. How much racism we have among ourselves. How much sectarianism we have among each other. Madahib. Background, color, language. How much hatred we have to our neighbors, Muslims, around us. Sometimes one masjid to another. I've seen this in different countries, like in Canada, I couldn't believe what was happening. Some masajid, members of the board were fighting among each other. Of the same organization. And the law, they took the, the, the case to court. And the lawyer says, these people have paid me so far. It's been for about, there for about three years. People taking over and making cases against one another. They said, I have received from these people $400,000 and it's the masjid's money. M donations. For what? Two groups among the, mem the, the, the board members. And that's not the only story. That's his special, specialization. He deals with masajid, Muslim organizations. He, he says, I'm drowned, you know, I'm swamped in work. I don't have a weekend, I work seven days just to deal with these cases. And he's making a lot of money. Why? Because I've seen some of those people. They just want to take over. It's social status for them to be uh, a board member. I'm involved in charity, social work in my community. Just for them to go and brag to their colleagues at work 
okay, you know, I do this and that. And then they say, no, we're doing this for the sake of the masjid, for the sake of the organ, for the sake of the community. All lies. And they say, you know, Muslims. Then we start complaining about what's happening to the Muslims there. <laughs> we're destroying one another, lying against one another. So much backbiting, lying, slandering is taking place. Why is this? Then we say, you know, what can we do to our brothers in Gaza? And we think it's not related. It's all, it all connects together. All connects. Remember the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, you are given victory and provision. Sorry, I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the hadith. You are given provision, your money, the money you get. And the victory and support from Allah ﷻ comes to you because of your weak ones. Something very unlikely. But that's the reality of things. And that's the reality of what's happening to our Muslim brothers and sisters all around the world. And we think, no, 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 it's, it's the political situation. It's the economy. Yes, I mean, these come into the equation somewhere, but they are not the root causes. You need to understand, you need to connect to the ways Allah makes things happen in this world. There's an inner logic, there's, there's a stream of meaning that runs through the universe. You can find hints of it in the Qur'an. You can find hints, in it, hints of it in your fitrah. If you look at the world, consider the world through the lens of the Qur'an, you will start to see that, that consistent, that permeating logic that runs through the world. There's meaning and it makes sense. But if you look at, at things from a non-Islamic perspective, you can only see the material causes. And they are mainly surface causes. Superficial stuff. Okay, so it's Rahmah. If you want, we want the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we want our Ummah to live in a state of mercy, and if we receive Allah's mercy, we won't be in this state. Focus on the brotherhood. You can't change the world, but just change yourself. Do you truly have real brotherhood towards your Muslim brothers and sisters? Do you have any kind of prejudice against Muslims coming from uh, Indonesia? So he's from Somalia, he's from Pakistan, he's from Saudi, he's from Egypt, he's from Morocco, he's from uh, uh, Bangladesh. Do you have any of these prejudices? It might be subtle, but check yourself out. Is it there? If it's there, that's a, that, that's a cause to prevent, to prevent Allah's mercy away from you. Even if we don't find the exact connection, but it's there. Here it is in the Quran. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes back into details. But these are universal details. It's verse number 11. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la yaskhar qawmun min qawm asa an yakunu khayran minhum. O you who believe, let no people <coughs> mock another. Don't mock one another. Don't mock others. In the UK, you say, take the mickey out of them, yeah? <laughs> Don't mock others, lest they may be better than you, which is actually the case most of the time. Because if a person resorts to mockery, that shows the corruption in their hearts. Usually the people who mock others are the worst type of people. Because a noble heart, a heart that is filled with Iman, does not stoop to that level of mockery. So usually if you see someone Mocking another, most of the cases, the one who is mocked is better than the one who is mocking them. Well, in worldly terms, it might not be the case. It might not be the case, but in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is. Especially with Muslims, talking about Muslims, the one who is mocked is usually better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you mock your Muslim brother, do you know what is the, re what is the basis for respect that we should have for one another? You might not like someone. He's a Muslim, you don't like him for the way he looks, the way he speaks, the way he behaves, whatever it is. Okay, you just like, dislike them for, for, for a personal reason. But you still have to respect them and give them their rights. What is the basis for that? The fact that they have belief in Allah, in their hearts, give them, gives them that position. Just because they have Iman in their hearts, even if it's an atom's weight of Iman, 
Just because of that, Iman is so precious and is so dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no matter how, you, how much you dislike a person, if they have the slightest amount of it, they deserve your respect and they deserve the rights of a Muslim upon his brother. Don't give him rights because of how he looks like or how he behaves. Don't, don't give him his rights because of that. Don't respect him because of that. Just because of the fact they have belief in Allah in their hearts. Just for the sake of Allah. That's what it means, love them for the sake of Allah. So what about mocking someone who believes in Allah? That's a huge thing. Don't look at them as blood and flesh. The reality of a person is his heart, what's in his heart. So when you mock someone and he has belief in Allah, that means you don't have that high level of respect for Allah. That's what it means. Then the verse goes on. وَلَا نِسَاءٌ مِّن نِسَاءٍ عَسَىٰ أَن يَكُنَّ خَيْرًا مِّنْهُنْ And women should not do the same thing, should not engage in that, in mockery. Why does Allah specify women here? Well, usually if Allah makes a general statement, it applies to men and women. Why does Allah mention women specifically here? Because that's more common among women. It's more common. It's more common among women than it is among men. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist among men, but usually it's more common. That's general in gen general terms. وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ And do not call each other names. Do not call others names. Not tell them, okay, you know, I don't have experience. I don't have, this part of the English language, I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> Tell me Arabic, come out. <laughs> so you might need to come in here and, and what are like common names you might use to describe someone? <laughs> Something still within, like, yeah, within uh, an acceptable level of politeness, let's say. Specky? Specky? Are you sure? Don't make me say something bad. <laughs> okay. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't call people names, that's it. Call them with the name they love. That's what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. He used to call people by the names they loved. Because it's, part, it's, it's some form of mockery. So don't call others uh, names. And do not insult them with your tongue. Sometimes you don't take the, these things seriously. You don't insult someone with your words. It's serious. Do you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this? Allah says, بِئْسَ لِسْمُ الْفُسُوقُ بَعْدَ الْإِيمَانِ What an evil thing to fall in. Okay, this is called fusuq. Allah calls it disobedience. A, a disgraceful, disgusting form of disobedience. What an evil thing to fall into this disobedience after having iman. It's a very bad thing after Embracing the realities about of Iman, this knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you go down to that level of calling people's names or insulting them. Those who do not repent, these are the oppressors, these are the people of injustice. Imagine when you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that title. You've been unjust to others. You've been, you've been an oppressor. You face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that after having faith. Serious. And the language in Arabic is quite threatening. There's a strong sense of threat there. What a disgusting, disgraceful level to stoop to after having embraced faith. Allah is making a threat, clear threat here. Those who do not repent, these are the oppressors, these are the wrongdoers, these are the people of injustice. And the ones who do wrong on the Day of Judgment, they will be held to account. So that's a strong threat. And as we said with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says great reward, you know it's a high level of great reward. Just as we said, the child says a great gift, a good gift. And a man who has authority and power and wealth says to you, I'll give you a great gift. 
it's different level. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a great reward, it's such a huge or high level of reward. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a threat, it's a serious threat. And when Allah mentions punishment, it's a powerful punishment. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Ya ladina amanu ujtanibu kathiran min al-dhan, inna ba'd al-dhan ithm. We said these are social ailments that destroy society and the Muslim community from inside. All you who believe, avoid so much of conjecture, dhan. Just arriving at conclusion, jumping to conclusions about people. Some of conjecture, some of your conclusions are sin. Imagine, you just have a thought about someone, you saw someone passing by, passing by uh, a nightclub or something, you say, uh, what was he doing there? You just say to yourself, it's only between you and yourself, you haven't done anything wrong, and that could be a sin. Some of this conjecture or these conclusions that you jump to are injustice, or are ithm, they are sin. And subhanAllah, here you can see, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating a barrier between us, between Muslims, and a circle, an inner circle of destroying the brotherhood among the Muslims. And that's subhanAllah, a beautiful way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, cultivates the Muslims. Just as with zina, Allah says, Allah doesn't say, don't fall into zina. He says, la taqrabu zina. Do not even come close to it. Don't even come close to zina. The same thing here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us uh, a cushion or a buffering zone against falling into anything that jeopardizes the brotherhood that we have among the Muslims, the unity, the strength. It is such a beautiful description of a Muslim society if we were to apply these things. In the Ba'd al-Dhani'ithm, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا Do not spy on one another. وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا And do not backbite one another. Look at these things, they are strongly related. If you jump to conclusions about someone, what does that mean? do? It creates curiosity. You want to find out more. What did he do? Where was he? Who was he with? So, curiosity. So, you develop this curiosity, you want to find out more. So what do you do? You start spying on the person. You spy on that person. You want to find out more. And the more you spy, you will see things, you will see parts, you will see things and you will miss so many things. So you'll only see part of the context, part of the truth. And you will end up talking about that which is backbiting. It's all linked. Oh, if you backbite someone, you instigate some curiosity with someone else. They want to find out more, they go and spy about that person. With spying, you don't get the whole truth. You start jumping to conclusions, having this kind of conjecture. And it's a vicious cycle. Vicious cycle. What deals with, the, with this problem at, a group, uh, at the root level is a beautiful hadith by the Prophet ﷺ where he says It's hard not to smile to a smiley face SubhanAllah, that's a good lesson <laughs> Honestly, smile with people, it's hard you know, not to smile back The Prophet ﷺ said a sign of perfection of someone's deen, someone's iman, is that he does not get involved in things that, of, that are of no concern to him. Things that are none of your business, you don't get involved in them. That's a sign of iman, high level of iman, perfection of your deen, perfection of your iman. What does that mean? It means a Muslim is focused, focused on what is beneficial. I see someone and he's in a dubious position, something tricky, fishy. I don't bother about him. I don't bother about it because I haven't seen the whole truth. Now, if I have a feeling in my heart, I might just go and give him advice, but don't jump to conclusions. Don't let shaitan initiate this vicious cycle of thought, 
conjecture, jumping to conclusions, trying to find out more about it. Because you will miss your own interest. You stop, you know, trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're busy with something else. So all of these are related. And by the way, all of these relate to what? They lead to Muslims fighting one another. It's all interrelated. Things in Islam all relate. You know, Imam Shafi'i used to say, after he made long travel, obviously he was in Mecca, based in Mecca, then he moved, studied in Medina, then he moved and studied in Iraq, then he moved and studied in Egypt, then he went back to Mecca. And he was a, a, a great scholar before he went back again to Egypt. Now, he, he, when he came to Mecca, to the Haram, and he said to people, you ask me any question and I will answer you from the Quran. Whatever your question is, and I will get you an answer from the Quran. Imagine. And people asked him about, uh, you know, stepping on wasps in the Haram, on an insect. What if you happen to step on it and kill it? What is the ruling in Islam? And he answered them from the Quran. Can you find an answer in the Quran for this question? He related it to the Quran. Everything is interrelated. Everything, you know, feeds into one another. Things are related. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives some, uh, some kind of parable or an analogy for people who backbite one another or backbite others. It means, would you be pleased, would you be okay with someone, with someone who eats the flesh of his brother as he is dead? His brother dies, he goes about eating his own flesh. How does it feel? People are better able to relate to sensory examples, physical things. So Allah knows that no one could uh, find this all right to eat someone's flesh. If someone is dead, you eat his flesh. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it to help us understand how evil and disgusting it is to backbite someone. It's exactly as if you're eating his flesh when he's dead. So disgusting, so repulsive. So if you can't find the connection and if you don't see it as repulsive as eating the flesh of a dead body of someone you know, someone close to you, then you still don't realize how, how evil backbiting is. Because the consequences of that are even worse. Because you are destroying the society, the Muslim community, the brotherhood. You're weakening the ummah because of words, might be one word that you, you say. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and definitely you hate that, you find it repulsive. Then Allah says, Wattaqullah. Again, back to a wider frame. It all goes down to your consciousness of Allah, to your awareness of Allah, to your fear of Allah's punishment. You might say, well, I'm, I'm so much used to backbiting. How can I deal with it? Okay, that, that's the, go back to a wide, bigger frame. You might, maybe you were brought up in an environment where backbiting is a daily activity. Okay, you want to break from it? Change the level or the frame. Go to a wider frame. Avoid it because it contradicts your awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and His punishment and His names and attributes. It will help you keep away from that sin. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about something that has to do with globalism, universality, the relationship between humans in general. Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu. O mankind, we, are, we created you from a male and a female, Adam and Hawa. So you are all the same. Regardless what your background is, what your color is, what your language is, what your education is, huh? we are all the same. We're all equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have a merit over the Chinese. Chinese don't have a merit over you. Okay, Africans don't have a merit over the Arabs. Arabs don't have a merit over them. It's, we're all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These have their strengths and these have their strengths, these have their weaknesses and those have their weaknesses. Same thing. We're humans. 
If Allah has deprived you of something, He has given you something else. If Allah has given someone else something good, He has given you also something equally good. On a, from a different angle. So we're equal. Don't say I'm an Arab, I'm better than the others. Don't say I'm, uh, I'm Chinese, I'm better than the others. Don't say I'm African, better than, I'm, I'm white, better than, the, better than the others. I'm Indonesian, I'm better than... Don't get in that, because it all doesn't make sense. Allah created, we came about from the same man and woman. We are brothers. We are brothers. The only criterion that Allah raises some people and lowers some people is the criterion of taqwa. How much aware and conscious you are of Allah. What is your connection with Allah? And how does this reflect on your actions? That's the only criterion. That's what makes a person better than the other. All other scales are irrelevant and make no sense. So Allah subhanahu wa says, then we created you into tribes and races. Why? Not to have racism and prejudice. No. It's just for you to get to know one another. This diversity creates curiosity, creates interests, and creates a state of com complementarity, where people complement one another. Because different people have different strengths and different weaknesses. And that's a reality in terms of races, different races. They have different orientations, different inclinations. You know, we complement one another. That's how it is. That's the only reason Allah created this diversity. Then Allah establishes the rule that we mentioned, that the most honorable among you is the one who is more, has more taqwa. That's it. More taqwa. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ Indeed, Allah is all-knowing and a higher level of that, that basic knowledge, Allah knows all the specifics. Khabir. Allah has enough detailed knowledge about everything. So that means you might think you are better than others, okay? but Allah knows in, indeed. You might think you have more taqwa than others, but Allah knows who, is truly, who truly has taqwa, who is better than the other. Allah knows. Because that, most of the time, that's hidden, that's unclear. You might find an imam, it might be someone, it might be a da'iyah. And you might find someone insignificant and he's better in the sight of Allah than this famous person who is da'iyah and could be hafidh and so on and so forth. That's what Allah, only Allah knows the reality of people's hearts. Then the later part of the surah, it talks about the Bedouins, the nomads who came to the Prophet وسلم, and they had this arrogant attitude, this pride. They said, we have believed, we have achieved belief, Iman. Now, you know that Iman usually, when it's mentioned in the Quran and in some of the hadith of the Prophet it means perfect Iman. Perfect Iman. Because the deen of Islam is three levels. You have Islam, which is you have the, at least the minimal, the minimum level of Islam accepted by Allah. You have Iman there. Okay? And you have the outward actions. That's Islam. The more you act, the more you go up into that upward spiral. Remember we said it all fits a closed system. So you, you get promoted to the level of Iman, where your Iman becomes so strong and very close to being complete. Powerful, so it impacts your actions, it impacts your attitudes, it impacts your thought process. You start to function based on this Iman, not on culture, not on your upbringing, not on your impressions, not on, you know, different stuff that we have. No, it's Iman that decides who you are and how you behave and how you act. That's a higher level, that's Iman. Then when you reach the apex, it's Ihsan. When you live your life and you're completely connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Completely connected with Allah as if you see Him. So the, these nomads, they came to the Prophet ﷺ, they said, we have believed. We have reached this level of Iman, strong Iman. Yeah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Prophet ﷺ to say to them, don't say we have believed, don't praise yourself, don't claim that, okay? Just say we have become Muslims, because that's the apparent thing. Allah knows who are the true, who have reached that high level of Iman. 
completeness of Iman, the perfection of Iman. Allah knows. So don't claim it. Just as in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يُزَكِّ مَيْشَاءَ Haven't you seen the people who praise themselves in terms of Iman? They say we have, we have Iman, we have the highest level of Iman, I am a believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah is the one who purifies people and raises them to these levels. So don't praise yourselves. Don't claim to have that. And the Prophet then Allah instructs him, say, tell them to say, we have, be we have become Muslims. We have embraced Islam. So that means we are struggling, we're trying. Okay? And Iman has not completely entered your heart. This higher level of Iman has not completely entered your heart. Entered your heart. You're still in the process. And if you obey Allah and His Messenger, Allah will not deny your rights. Allah will not deny you good actions. That means Allah will reward you for it. Allah is thankful. Allah will increase you if you do more righteous deeds. Increase you in Iman. You see, Iman gets higher when you do more righteous deeds with sincerity. Inna Allah ghafoor rahim. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Allah forgives. Even if you made this statement, you come back to the Prophet's advice. Allah will forgive you and Allah will bring you mercy. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a clear statement. The true believers are the ones who have believed in Allah and His Messenger. This is number 15. Then, and they had no doubts. So they had complete belief, conviction, yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. And they did not turn back on their heels. They didn't entertain doubts about the articles of faith. And then this reflected on the actions because Iman has to reflect on the actions. If you claim to have Iman, it doesn't reflect. There's something missing there. Iman, we said the heart is connected to the actions. Everything is connected. So then they have striven. They have made jihad in themselves and in their wealth and themselves. So they have jeopardized everything in striving to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever the situation requires. الصادقون, these are the truthful ones. These are the ones who, who, when they say we have embraced Islam, these are the truthful ones. Or if they say we have Iman, these are likely to be truthful because their claim matches, their, or their actions match their claims. They are more likely to be telling the truth. Then, I will just quickly f finish this. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is posing a question to them. Are you trying to teach Allah about the reality of your faith? About, what, about the level of your Iman? Allah knows. You don't have to say that. Why, you know, Allah is questioning their motive behind saying we have believed, we have reached the high level of Iman. Allah is questioning, what's the point? If it's a reality, only Allah is concerned with this. You shouldn't tell people. And Allah knows, you don't have to tell him. Allah knows your heart. He knows your heart more than you do. And he says, so why are you trying to tell Allah? And Allah knows everything in the heavens and the earth, and Allah knows everything. Then number 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in reality, some of these people are trying. Why is this a sneeze? Oh. <laughs> okay. They cut my trail of thoughts. Okay, Allah is, is questioning their motive. He says, actually the real motive behind these people, or some of these people saying this, is they are trying to give the impression that they have a favor on you, O Muhammad. We have accepted your message. Okay, so you owe us. They're trying to establish a position of favor that, oh, you know, we have believed, so you should be thankful to us. Which doesn't make sense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing the Prophet to say to them, قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّوا عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ Do not see it or deem it as a favor that you have embraced Islam. It's not your favor. It is Allah's favor that He brought you to Islam. That's the reality. This exactly matches what we just said before that 
it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fadlam min Allahi wa ni'mah. The fact that you love faith and you follow it and you hate disbelief and keep away from it, that's a gift from Allah. It's not your own merit. So that's the reality. If you are following Islam, you don't have any merit in that. It's Allah's gift. Always attribute it back to Allah. Don't attribute it to yourself. It could be taken away from you. Be thankful. When you attribute it to yourself, you're not being thankful to Allah. Be thankful to Allah. Whatever good you do, if you do some sadaqah, if you do a salah, just say to yourself, I did that because Allah caused me to do it. Allah caused me to do it. And just say, turn to Allah and say, Oh Allah, I'm thankful that you just made me do this prayer. How many people are out there smarter than you, clever the, cleverer than you, probably have more mm, better qualities than you have, but they don't have this gift. And Allah gave it to you. So just stand to Allah, thank Him. Every time you pray, every time you do something good, thank Allah for it. You might say, it's time to boast about it. No, it's time to be thankful because it's Allah who guided you to do it. Allah put, put obedience inside you to do it. Be thankful to Allah. That's the best attitude. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes. Here Allah wraps up the whole surah. Wraps up the whole surah in one of his attributes, one of his names. Allah says, Inna Allah ya'lamu ghayba samawati wal ard Wallahu basirun bima ta'malun. Indeed, Allah knows all the hidden things and the apparent things in the heavens and the earth, and Allah watches and is aware of everything you do. That's how you wrap up the surah. If you truly believe that Allah knows everything and sees everything, you have no problem implementing everything in this surah. It will follow naturally, actually. It will follow naturally. So this surah is an explanation of one of the names of Allah. Al-Alim. The All-Knowing. And it's related to Al-Basir. In Allah Basirun bima ta'man. Allah sees everything you do. He's the All-Seer. Simple. See how everything in Islam relates to each other. Belief relates to our ethics, manners, our behavior. And it impacts powerfully our society. It builds, brings the community together. And it has to do with the levels of Iman, Islam, Iman and Ihsan. And it all wraps up together in understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if we read every surah that we know just like that. Do you think Quran would have a powerful impact or not? Definitely. So this wasn't a tafsir in the real sense of the word, it was just some kind of reading, uh, reading the surah in depth. That's what, this is how we should read every surah at least. That's the minimum, by the way. That's the minimum. So I'm just hoping that this was helpful. It was helpful to me. Uh, my main point, and I always love to uh, see this among Muslims more, is that you link everything in Islam to your daily life. <coughs> If you link it to your daily life, to your daily activity, your relationship with Allah will change. Your relationship with the Quran will change. Don't, you know, put the Quran and Islam in one aspect of your life and have another aspect where, is, where things are irrelevant. Don't do that. You know, I don't believe in the issue of separating church and state or give what is, belongs to Caesar to Caesar and give what belongs to God to God. This have no place in Islam. And this is incorrect because the whole world was created for us to worship Allah. Every, even work, the fact that you have a job was meant by Allah that you worship Him through it, ultimately. Allah says, in, Inna kulla Everything, we created it according to a precise measure and for a certain reason. So nothing happens just like that, randomly. So everything in this world should lead back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it doesn't, it's either you can't find the connection or this thing does not lead to Allah. It leads somewhere else. So you should leave it. Or learn the connection, if there's a connection. And that's, that, this is what we mean by seeking knowledge. If knowledge doesn't create that kind of link, it is just some information you're storing in your head and it doesn't benefit you. Okay? So 
That's what I have to say. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakumullah khair for your patience.